Okay, can people hear now? Somebody chat. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so this is our first in person yes. and Zoom meeting. So uh, we may have a couple of technical difficulties. We'll work them out what? during the announcement. Part. What could go wrong? There you go. <laughs> So I want to let everyone know that um, we're going to have the ghost dinner and ghost tour this year, August 27th and 28th, which we're very excited again to be able to do that. Uh, dinner will be at the Mono Inn, and uh, I spoke with uh, the new owner, Hillary, and she promises to have a very nice dinner and a great time for all of us. Then um, we have the art raffle going on with the um, with the ghost tour and the dinner, and it's a beautiful photograph of the Sam houses that are on uh, 395. The um, the artwork is displayed at the museum. It's also on our website. And it's at the museum. <laughs> for a dollar a piece or six for five. And let's see, dinner and the tour tickets are on sale by calling the museum. Uh, you can order them online or stop them in at the museum. One of the things you'll notice if you order them online is the system is charging you sales tax. But when I see the order, I am refunding the sales tax until we figure out how to make it understand not to, uh, to charge sales tax. Dave, anything else about the ghost tour? Uh, sure. I'll have to come Hold it down for two seconds and then we'll tell you. Is it working? And you have to stand over here. Well, I, can, I could just be a voice. <laughs> Robin is doing such a good job, by the way. Um, I mean, really, everybody should know that. It's been, it's not always been easy and it's not been, what am I talking about? I got to tell you about the ghost. Um, so we have a great lineup of speakers, I think, on this topic, which is um, return to Lower Rush Creek uh, history and remembrances. Does that sound right? Close anyway. And so the dinner speaker is someone who has spoken to our group before uh, and is on the board of trustees, Barry McPherson. Um, because the McPherson history um, does include the history of Rush Creek, um, the, you know, if people were, may know about the Mono Inn, they remember that they may have a goat ranch out on the island. But the, one of the main reasons they came up here was part of this project to uh, try to move water out of Rush Creek in a channel and, and develop real estate in the east side of the Mono Basin. He's going to tell all that good story. And um, then on Saturday, we have a couple of Bobs. We have Bob Marks, who's going to, who's been doing a whole lot of research about the history on the, the homestead and the water movement and Indian land and a lot of things. We are, we've got speakers that are going to talk about the Indians that lived at Rush Creek, the, 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 the Kuzeka Paiute, uh, that um, made their homes right there along Rush, Lower Rush Creek. And then the other Bob is Bob Vestal, whose father was Eldon Vestal, who was a <laughs> and, uh, very involved in watching and monitoring and uh, agitating about what happened to Rush Creek once LA came into the basin through the Bird Street. So um, there's more that I'm forgetting here, but the, oh, the, there's hunting ponds by the uh, Brosky down there, um, a lot of things. And it's going to be a it's going to be a good full day. And um, I hope you can all come and be part of it. What? It's great to be back. <laughs> it is great to be back. Okay, thank you, Dave. And then um, our other event that we'll be having soon is our uh -huh. art and ice cream, and it is scheduled for July 17th. You bet. So Priscilla's going to come up and talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you need to go potty each day now. So this event is artist and huh? ice cream. And I have a committee, Linda LaPierre and um, Deanna Bone Rundle. And um, we're getting, trying to get this thing all planned up. But here's the first thing. If 
you know of an artist who would be willing to come. I think we have six. Um, I was hoping we could have up to 10. Um, please let me know. It would just be for that one day on the 17th. Um, we go from 10 until 4 o'clock. It's going to be, I think, a very pleasant event. We will be outside using the solar pavilion and the area around there. And we're having ice cream that's donated, also toppings that are going to be uh, donated. And it actually is free. We're hoping for donations, of course. Um, we're going to have the artists out there with their tables. And then we will uh, have live musicians playing. And that will be all acoustic music will be up against the size of the museum. So please come and support this event. It's the first year we have it. You don't necessarily have to stay this up the whole time, but just come and buy a raffle ticket. So we're going to be selling raffle tickets. Uh, for drawings, the drawings will be each artist is going to donate one item or more if they want. And so then depending on how many items we have, then we'll have that many um, drawings. Do we have any questions? I have a question. How many are coming? Let's hear hands. Let's see the hands. What are the hours? All right. Ten until four. Ten until four. Linda. Right. Yes, that's Linda's idea, and, she, and she's going to get that all so set up. The so people at home would not yeah. have heard that. You have to repeat you it. You have to repeat that right Oh, now. I must repeat that. Yeah. Okay. For those at home, <laughs> uh, Linda Lapierre is going to get together some of the artwork in the museum. And she will bring that outside and have some kind of booth or table. So it's a chance for you to also see some of this um, artwork that has been collected by the museum. That won't be for sale, but um, the other artist's work will be for sale. Anything else? Okay, I hope to see all of you there and tell your friends and neighbors about it. I think it should be very fun, relaxing, and it won't rain, will it? No. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Priscilla. Okay, the, uh, another event that we're going to have at the end of July is a new one for us, and uh, one of our new trustees, Janice Mendez, is uh, working on this, and we're going to have an Indian taco sale, July 31st, and it will be from 11 o'clock to, I'm not sure when, but we'll, we'll get flyers out and we'll know when. She was talking about maybe going till 7 o'clock. And uh, so we're uh, pretty excited about that. And so as more information comes, we'll put it on the website and send emails out to folks. Um, just a few other announcements. Uh, since we're able to have the ghost, the um, basket of the, month, of the month raffle that we were talking about last month we're not going to do. We're going to uh, instead put the efforts into the raffles that go on at the ghost tour. Is that right, Linda? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Did you tell, I can't remember if I heard you tell people how to buy tickets. Yes, I did. And uh, She's speaking now and I can't hear. Huh? That's hard. I'm going to get milk and say I can't hear her. Get a day plan. I um, wanted to let everyone know that um, we did get a statement of work from uh, Historic Corps for the work at the Conway Ranch. Um, it's pretty expensive. It's $103,000 plus. 
Yes. And so I did reach out to the county and spoke with uh, Joe Blanchard, who encouraged us to um, put in a project request form with the county, which we have. They're going to review projects this week and let us know. Uh, I have said that the, um, the Historical Society will assist in, um, in raising funds. And then we can also do volunteer work. We also received a proposal for the Felicina House stabilization, and it was even higher. Um, but I have uh, yet to um, work with LADWP for um, potential assist with funding and permission to even stabilize the building. So there's more to come on that. So that is um, pretty much it for the uh, announcements. Does anybody have anything else? Okay, the, Dave just asked for our museum hours, and we are open 10 to 4, Thursday through Monday. So we're closed Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Any other questions? We've had a lot of nice visits to the museum. Um, we've even had uh, international um, visitors again, which is, uh, which is nice to see. Um, we're going to keep trying this in-person meetings with, uh, with the Zoom. Now, next month is going to be um, our own Dave Carl is going to do a presentation, a pertinent history of fire in Eastern California. And let's see, I'm thinking about, um, I said we were going to start the presentation at 630. So, Rich, how many people do we have on? We now have 18 people. I think they're slightly less frustrated than, than they were. They had heard about uh, three quarters, perhaps, of what you said. Okay. <laughs> so we're working on the technical things on your oh, There we go. That's good. That's good. So, um, do you want me to just keep rambling? <laughs> That's it. So we're gonna we're just gonna keep on rambling here for a little while, and uh, and hopefully we can uh, get all of our technical issues squared around, and we'll be all ready for Jennifer, who will be talking to us about the working dogs of the Eastern Sierra, and uh, Jennifer is going to present us with stories and photographs of the real dogs who work on the east side of the Sierra Nevada in California. I think this is going to be a really exciting one, um, especially for my family, since my husband is a veterinary surgeon. And um, we actually were, he worked on quite a few working dogs, mainly cattle dogs. Yes, Dave. Can you tell people, or would you like to hear about anything that's happening? Oh, can you do that? Because you probably know more than me. It's, yeah. it's the seventh. Seven. Yes. Yeah. Okay, today is July 5th, and um, on July 7th, so that's Wednesday, um, over at the pavilion, there's going to be a very interesting sounding, I haven't seen it, uh, film shown, but, and before that, uh, a, a presentation by some speakers. Um, the, see, I wish I don't have something in front of me, so I, I'll forget. Manzanar Diverted is the name of this documentary film. And it sounds like it would just be about maybe about Manzanar and the, the World War II internment camp. But it's uh, broadly much more than that. And, and it, it has a lot to do with the whole water story of the, of the Eastern Sierra and uh, particularly the, the story in relation to the first people, the, the Paiute uh, folks of this area. And so um, it's free. You can come. It will start at 7 o'clock, I believe. That's right. Does that sound right? I think so. And then the, at, they are saying the film will be at 8. Um, I have a feeling it'll be a little later than that based on how dark we want it to be, but we'll see. <laughs> that's, that's the concept anyway. Um, and, uh, or maybe it'll be a cloudy night. But, um, so there'll be, there'll be a seating. There'll be, um, it's the kind of thing, you know, in the Mono Basin where if you're coming to something in the evening outdoors, um, all of you who, who live around here should know this already. Um, 
plan for it to cool off and uh, you know bring bring some blankets or you know at least to dress right for for it to get cold so sitting there in the evening i think the video you know, the movie is an hour and a half long about that long so it'll be over about 9 30 something like that and um yeah so we're supporting it we're gonna give them our, our loan them our chairs so <laughs> You taking the chairs. We're we're loaning our chairs as well as Dave's labor. <laughs> so let's see. We've got about five more minutes that um, we need to ramble on. Anybody have anything else? Oh, great, Janet. So hi, everybody. Um, yeah, just wanted to talk a little bit about our solar pavilion and how much people are enjoying it. And it's um, all kinds of events are happening there, which is really what we hoped <laughs> when we were building it. The people would go, oh, yeah, it's great to have this. So um, I'm really excited about this movie, in fact, and I'm just hoping it's dark enough. But, um, you know, that kind of thing is possible because we have all the the hookups with the electrical and all. Um, I also wanted to tell you about the car charger. So we do have a level two car charger at the pavilion. And uh, it was hard to judge last summer because hardly anybody came. Nobody was driving around. But this year we, we were having, you know, dozens of people plugging in. Um, almost every time I go by, somebody's plugged in. So uh, Teslas can use it with an adapter and everybody else. Um, it's like the people's car charger. Every car works there. So we're trying to encourage uh, people to look into electric cars and help provide, you know, for their needs and have them walk around Lee Mining and spend money while they're charging. So the EV charger is working great, too. So thanks, everybody out there that helped on the pavilion and you guys in this room, too, um, because um, it's really coming into its own and it's being used. And that's what we were hoping for. Yay. Yay. <laughs> so I just wanted to say that I've noticed a lot of cars part, are charging there at that pavilion when, uh, when I'm at the museum. And it also brings people into the museum. And uh, they're, they're coming into the museum, they're looking at the outdoor exhibits, and then they're wandering on their way over to Monocone. Yes, Dave. Okay, so what Dave asked is um, planned changes to the, the grounds. What we're going to try to do is to protect our artifacts from the water. And we've had a problem with our outdoor exhibits for quite a few years getting wet from the sprinklers. So what uh, we're working with the county and we're working on having them reposition the sprinklers so that some of our grass will die off and then we will lift the um the artifacts and the county has said that they will provide labor and we need to provide the gravel and the um weed fabric and uh, and then we will be able to keep hopefully keep water off of our artifacts and uh, we're excited to be able to do that. It's something that's uh, been a problem for a while, but the beautiful green grass is wonderful to have. So we're trying to come to a, um, a spot where we can have grass, but we can protect the artifacts at the same time. So that's, uh, that's our plan there. Do I need to talk slower? Okay. Okay, so since the 15th, we have, uh, uh, the 15th of June, we have been able to have the museum open with uh, the only restrictions that we have is there is a sign, no one is asked whether or not they are, um, they are vaccinated, but um, it's, if you are unvaccinated, you're asked to wear a mask. Otherwise, people come right on in. I have noticed that um, a lot of the foreign travelers, they are wearing masks. And have you noticed that as well, Linda? Yeah. And yes, 
and a lot of the, the kids, the children are still are, are masking up. Um, it's really fun to watch the kids in the upside down house. And um, this year, I think it was actually um, Linda's grandson that took pictures of his kids inside the upside down house. And then he took it on his phone and flipped the picture upside down. So the kids were upside down. The kids are having a blast with that. And every parent that I tell them, you know, if you take a picture, you can turn it upside down. The kids are like, oh, I was upside down in the upside down house. And it's really, it's, it's fun to watch. It's fun to watch. So how are we doing, Rich? There is a question like to have you talk about the upcoming programs. Okay, so let's see. Dave, do you have them in your head? Yeah. Okay, because I have to get on the website, so. One of these days, I, I'm just going to disappear, but no. um, I'm still around. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, so see what I can. You talked about August. Uh, the always the meetings are the first Monday in, in the month. Um, August, I'm going to be the speaker. Um, and let me think. Um, September is it? Uh, I, I know October is Bob Marks. Bob Marks is one of the speakers for the Ghost. He's he's going to be here for October. I'm trying to remember September. I think it may be Paul McFarland. Uh, that, that sounds right. And November, oh boy, who did this to me? What are the other two? There's two, I got November and December lined up and I tell you they'll be great. But uh, I'm trying to think, just throwing. Chris Spiller. And um, Chris is maybe September and maybe Paul is maybe. Okay, so we think Chris Spiller is September and hers is on, uh, it's on the website and I, Yes. Yes, it's the Adventures of McTarnahan, and so it'll be it'll be an interesting talk, and so and then I think you're right. I think Paul is. Okay, so Paul is later, and Cole Hawkins, our vice president is doing next year because Dave is busy already lining up people for next year. And uh, and right now we're just all having a little bit of a brain fade, but uh, <laughs> well, uh, they are the ones that we have titles for are listed. I if I have not yet received a title from the speaker, then we don't have them yet listed. So I think now. We have hit 6.30, or right about 6.30, so we're going to go ahead and start with Jennifer. Oh, yes. So we just had a question about how many chargers that we had currently. And there's one charger with the ability to charge two cars at the same time, right, Janet? Okay. All righty. So now we're going to turn it over to Jennifer. We're really excited. So working dogs of the Eastern Sierra. Yay! Thank you very much, Robin. Thank you so much for inviting me back. I just love coming up here. I think this is the second time I've been here in person. And then last year, I was able to be on Zoom, but really a pleasure to come and talk to this group. And today we're going to talk about dogs, which is a, a favorite topic for many of us. And so it actually started here. This is the cover of the last book project that I worked on. And I was, so I had written the book project, The Mammoth Letters, which was mostly about mammoth in the Eastern Sierra. And I was thinking about what I would like to work on next. And I was hiking up to Crystal Lake. And it was one of those scenes where it's like person, two dogs, two people, three dogs. And I started thinking, you know, this is an extremely dog supportive 
the area. And it would be really interesting actually to talk about the dogs in this area because we have so many different environments. And so I, I thought, you know, maybe I could put together a book about working dogs or the dogs of this area. And then this is where it all got started. So I just posted on Facebook and said, hey, does anybody have working dogs in the area? And Eric got in touch with me. Uh, so this is Jenny Rue, and she works as an avalanche dog and June Mountain, obviously. And she's really kind of a special dog. So I, I talked to Eric, you know, quite a long time about her. She comes from a really prestigious um, kennel in Colorado that's run by Ann Weichman, I think her name is. She was the first female park ranger in Colorado. And so Eric and his wife went up there to get this dog. And it turned out that wasn't good enough. So she really had to vet them. So it turns out they had to spend the night in order to, you know, kind of qualify for Jenny. But fortunately, they passed. And so uh, he got to come home with Jenny. This is another a quite famous dog. And this dog is part of the Eastside Canine program. So this is King with Sean Macedonia, who began that program. And really, my hat is off to them for what they were able to accomplish. So Sean was working as a ski patrol guy. And he was thinking, you know, we have avalanche danger here in Mammoth, just as other ski resorts do, but we don't have any kind of avalanche dog program. And so he started talking to the folks at Tahoe who were really supportive and really, you know, willing to share their knowledge about how you'd start that kind of program. And there's some great stories in the book about how King basically selected Sean to be his, to be his odor and his handler. Um, but Sean was thinking, you know, he had in mind maybe having kind of a golden retriever, what he thought of more of a, like a teddy bear kind of dog, that that would be less intimidating to people on the slopes. He himself had actually had a Border Collie, and since I learned so much about breeds and Border Collies during the course of writing this book, it's funny, so his Border Collie was named Stanley, and he said that he swears if Stanley had opposable thumbs, he could have taught that dog to drive his truck. <laughs> it was really, but it kind of opened his eyes to the possibility of how smart these dogs are and how, you know, how much you can train them. So this is King and uh, Sean doing their work. And so here you get a sense really of kind of the challenges that there are for the dogs. I mean, just the equipment that they're exposed to, the surfaces that are, they're exposed to, the people. And it's just amazing what a great dog job they did sort of creating this program. And since I come out of the corporate world and I'm very interested in management, the other thing I was really interested in was how Sean had the presence of mind to think about how having a dog would affect the career of, a, of the ski patrol people. And that that in fact would be kind of an enhancement to their career to have a dog and be partnered with the dog on the ski slope. So. And really, these guys just did an amazing job with that program. And here we are, 20 years later. This is Trico. He's an Entelbucher Mountain Dog with his handler here, Steve. And uh, yeah, he's up there in the gondola. Uh, I was really flattered, actually. Uh, so Steve's mother posted an Amazon review of the book. And she said, well, I don't know about the other stories, but I can vouch for the truthfulness of this particular story. So I'm like, well, I have one at least. <laughs> but yeah, really fun to see that how this program has expanded and, and really, you know, how interesting it is now for the ski patrol folks. They have a bunch of dogs now in their program. And they really thought through things like insurance and, you know, what does it mean if you've got a dog that gets sick and who's going to cover that. So they've done a, they've really done a remarkable job. And of course, they've used these dogs for education purposes too. So Sean had the idea, you know, that the kids would like to see kind of a teddy bear sort of dog, but they've also used it use these dogs in educational programs to talk about the dangers of avalanche. And, you know, we've had our situations on the mountains. So 
all of that to keep people's attention is certainly worthwhile. Um, and of course, they've made plushies out of these dogs too. So Steve tells this funny story about walking down the street in Mammoth in summertime. He's in flip flops and trike goes with him. And this little uh, car pulls up next to him. And there's a child in the back seat. And he calls out, is that Trico? And Steve's like, well, yes, it is, you know, famous dog, right? And the little guy in the car, like, reached out, and he had a plushie of Trico in his hand. He's like, I've got one. <laughs> so, yeah, it's really been effective. It's worked well. So this is Chief. He's, uh, I would say he's kind of the daddy of the program now. So he's the most mature dog. Um, I wrote the book in 2019. And I did meet Chief um, and Scott in the village this winter when I was working there. And Chief is aging. He can't hear as well as he used to. Uh, but he, you know, he's still working. He's still out there. One of the things I should mention, somebody got in touch with me about asking about photographs in the book. When I first envisioned this project, I thought that I would need to hire a photographer. And there are just a number of logistic issues with that. Like, was I going to try and make an appointment to go see a dog? And then, you know, were you really going to get very good photographs if you're, if the dogs aren't actually working, right? And so what, you know, what hurdles does that put in front of you? As it turns out, dog owners take a whole bunch of photos of their dogs. So people just had really, really excellent dogs of their photos already. I didn't need to hire a photographer. But some of these photos in the book are taken by professional photographers, and this is one. And they really um, were very generous in sharing their artwork with me. I asked permission to use them in the book. And everyone granted me permission. So here's an example of a professional shot that, of course, no matter how much I had spent on a professional photographer, I wasn't going to get this, this uh, shot. So this uh, photograph was taken by Nick Souza of Nick Souza Photography. And I'm really, you know, very appreciative and very honored that they let me use their photographs in the book. And this is why you can't... <laughs> <laughs> this is why you came to this talk. So <laughs> I know I'm cheating. I'm totally cheating with this talk. So yeah, this photo I did not use in the book, but um, this is King. And yeah, so this is just an example too of, you know, how Sean started exposing King to surfaces and noise and just, you know, what it's like on a ski resort. But yeah, there are lots and lots of stories about King. He was a really, really cool dog. This is Takoda with Christina Ackerman. And Takoda and Christina were part of Mono Search and Rescue. And this actually shows the legacy of King because she was really drawn to getting a golden retriever after she met King and learned about him. So there are lots of really great things about golden retrievers. But she said, actually, as a search and rescue dog, Mm, the next time she chose one, she chose a different breed, and we'll see that dog in a minute. The issue with Golden Retriever is, well, there are several, actually. One is they're really heavy, and so they have a tendency to get overheated when they're searching. And then some of the, some of the dogs also would develop snowballs under their feet. But also, the fact that they're brown when you're doing search and rescue, she said the brown dog would just take off and vanish into the landscape. Right. And then she just, she finally put a bell on him because she'd just be standing there for five or 10 minutes having no idea where her dog was. So this is what she chose next. This is Ayla. And this is a white Swiss shepherd, much smaller dog. I wrote to Christina today because I'm a little bit confused about this. I saw her in the parade yesterday and she had a massive white dog with her. So Either Ella has grown a lot or she had a different dog with her. I'm hoping that it was a different dog because if Ella has turned out to be that massive dog she had with her, then yeah, her planning somehow went sideways. Just a comment about breeds. I grew up with German Shepherds. And so when I first uh, was learning about the breeds, I asked Eric, the guy at June Mountain about breeds. I said, how come I'm not seeing any German Shepherds? And Eric is an extremely uh, diplomatic, nice person. And so he says, oh, German Shepherds are great. You know, German Shepherds, they're the greatest dogs. They're really, 
really good dogs. That the the only thing about German Shepherds is, well, they bite people. <laughs> I was like, ah. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, more, more cheating with the photographs here. Uh, so this is a photograph that is of the Sierra Dog Ventures. So Christy and her partner, Duncan, run the Sierra Dog Ventures. And this is, you might call it a dog walking service. I mean, I guess in, in a normal environment, that's what it would be. But what they do here is they take the dogs up onto the public lands and let them run free without leashes. And it's really interesting to talk to her about dog dynamics and dog psychology. But one of the things is letting dogs off leash does change their behavior. So she said a lot of dogs that will be fairly aggressive on a leash, but not when they're running in a group like this. So she has two dogs in here, Johnny and Oso. And so they act kind of like team leaders. So I said that was a job. They kind of chose their own own job. Uh, but she can have as many as 17 dogs off leash. And just watching, you know, how the dogs all interact with each other. She said the dogs are often much more comfortable if they have someone like Johnny or Oso kind of, you know, orchestrating this is how it works. This this is what we do. This is how we stay together. And here's how we behave in particular. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, she said they're really good mediators, especially Oso, which is her pit bull German Shepherd mix. But she said he's just a really loving dog, very caring. And so he kind of watches out for the new dogs. If a dog starts being picked on or harassed, Oso will intervene to to protect the dog. Really interesting. And then this is Bolt. He's an Australian blue healer and he lives down in Bishop on an Indian reservation. And he's kind of this, he's actually really famous. He's got like, I don't know, 7,000 followers on Instagram or some crazy thing. Yeah, so he has a, he, he's a social media yeah, a star. Uh, but he's really an interesting, fun dog, just likes to do all kinds of different things. And she's the owner, Leah, says that he's just in charge of everything in the corral. So, you know, he's always bossing everybody around, including her. Like when she like goes into the house, he'll like nip her on the heels, like get in there. That. <laughs> but I guess he has a uh, personality clash, you might say, with a pony. I don't know if any of you have any experiences with ponies, but yeah, I had a few. And, you know, ponies often think they're top dogs and Bolt thinks he's the top dog. So, yeah, the pony and, and Bolt kind of have some issues together. And this is Diller. Bolt is a shelter dog, and so is Diller, this beautiful dog. Uh, this dog's owned by Leah Webb. I don't know if you know her, but she does all kinds of different, you know, adventures, and she goes out to where there are fires and science projects, and Diller is her companion for all those projects. Just a beautiful dog, and this is a bonus photo. This photo's not in the book, but you all get to see it. <laughs> yeah, it's really a beautiful photograph and really a special dog. And then here are two retail dogs. Yeah, so, you know, retail dogs are dogs that work, work out of a shop, so to speak. I decided I'd expand the definition from working dogs to include them too. And so these are French bulldogs. The breed is really an interesting breed. I didn't know very much about them. So they're bred down from mastiffs, you know, real bulldogs, right? Dogs that were supposed to interact with bulls to be lap dogs, to be companion dogs in France. Um, but one of the things that I think is interesting about Tony and Roger here is that, you know, even you, you can take this kind of frou-frou dog, right? I think that's how we think of these lap dogs. But when you bring them to the Eastern Sierra, they turn into Eastern Sierra dogs. So like these dogs really like to go fishing and collect sticks. And she says it's just really funny to have these little Frenchies just really out in nature doing all these things that big dogs would do. And then this is Bella. So 
I wanted to find a hunting dog because there's hunting here and hunting dogs, you know, just really have extraordinary training and talents in assisting their owners in the practice of hunting. So the sports sporting goods store in Bishop hooked me up with uh, Eric because of this remarkable dog. Bella is kind of known around Bishop as being a very well-trained, very talented dog. So I got in touch and Eric sent me this photograph. <laughs> I was like, hmm, yeah, dead ducks, right. <laughs> and so I tried a lot of things. I tried to like blur out the dead ducks. So it, you know, it wasn't quite so obvious that there were that they were dead ducks. And it it was still kind of clear what was happening there. So I went got back in touch with Eric and I was like, really great shot. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, I'd really like to have two photos of Bella because he had sent me another really nice photo of her in a blind. Do you think you could find a different photo of her? And he's like, this is what they do. This, you know, this is right. And so it's like, yeah, I know, I know. So finally he's like, fine. So he sent me this picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my husband said, yeah, I think you might sell a few more copies of the book with that photo. But I was so impressed with myself, right, with the, with the photo before, like this professional hunting dog, right? So my cousin lives in Wisconsin and is a big hunter. His Christmas newsletter is always full of all the things he's killed that year. So I sent him the photograph of Bella with the ducks so just to like show off, right? How cool we are in California that we have these hunting dogs. He was totally unimpressed. So he writes back to me and he's like, yeah, you guys in California, you name your hunting dog a name like Bella. What kind of name is that? <laughs> And then this is Rusty, a cattle dog. Rusty is actually my favorite dog in the book. And just learning about these cattle dogs, how hard they work, how dangerous their job is, you know, dealing with cows that don't want to go where the dogs want them to go. And the dusty, thirsty, dangerous work, you know, you can be killed instantly from being kicked by a cow. So, uh, mm-hmm. A little brown. Yeah, nose to nose with the cow. Yeah, so that blur of brown, that's rusty. And that, you know, it's really true of the cattle dogs, right? They're always in motion, they're always working. And here you can see he's really in a standoff with that cow. The cow does not want to do what Rusty wants him to do. And so, you know, they you they're just amazing the things that they can do. So I really liked Rusty. He's just a tough little cattle dog. So in 2019, when the book came out at the book festival that year, I invited all the dogs to come. And there are like, I don't know, 35, 38 dogs that in the book. And most of them came. It was like a dog madhouse at the book festival. And Rusty came. And of course, I was just beside myself because I'm in love with Rusty. But Rusty was actually not that thrilled to be at the book festival. You know, it was clear. He felt definitely out of his element. And yeah, where are the cows? But yeah, I was so thrilled to meet Rusty. So here we are at the book festival. So as usual, I didn't plan this very well. So the dogs all came, right? And so we just had zillions of dogs. And then a lot of kids came, right, to meet the dogs. And everyone's just kind of milling around because I didn't know what I was doing. And so somebody said, what are you going to do? I mean, you should do something with the dogs. They're all here. I'm like, no, I don't know what to do. So somebody got this idea to have Robert up on the stage. That's Robert Yoki, who's the president of the Southern Mono Historical Society. And he's my partner in crime with the book festival. So some, he got this idea to get up on stage and then interview the dogs one by one. And it was a blast. That was by far the highlight of the festival and it was completely unplanned. But here he is interviewing Ann Parks and Tinker. And this is a puppy that's in training for the guide dogs for the blind. 
And I don't know if you know about this program, but Anne runs this program through Bishop and Mammoth, where people take in puppies that are eventually potentially going to be guide dogs for the blind. And then the people who take them in as puppies do kind of, you know, elementary training with them. So it's kind of a big deal. And then it's it's big question about whether or not these dogs will actually succeed as guide dogs or not. So they get their elementary training here and then they get sent to, you know, kind of big dog training through the guide dogs for the blind program. And a lot of the dogs don't make it, right? It's, you know, not everybody is cut out to be a guide dog. But anyway, it was really interesting for him to uh, interview Anne and get to know more about Tinker. And then um, here I am, I'm dressed as Laura Ingalls Wilder. That's why I look kind of funny. Also, I was extremely wound up that day because I was so excited to meet all these dogs. And this is Journey. And Journey is another really remarkable dog, quite renowned in Southern California. She and Mike are part of the Riverside County Sheriff's Department Search and Rescue but Journey is actually a cadaver dog, so a human remains detection dog and extremely skilled. Again, a border collie, which Mike said is not that common to use as a human remains detection dog. But once he said once you have them trained, they're great. It's just border collies are awfully smart. And so he said sometimes he could tell Journey's like, oh, I don't need to do this. I, I got this. So yeah, training is a little bit more of a challenge with them. Journey, was, Journey and Mike were both up here looking for Carly Guzet when she went missing. So they worked with the Mono County Search and Rescue uh, with John Bush, I think, when they were up here. So he knows this area quite well, even though they're stationed, so to speak, down in Riverside. But yeah, you know, it's really interesting to talk to Mike about his work. Often very sobering work can be very traumatic. You know, we as humans, when we learn about these stories of people who have gone missing or been murdered or, you know, terrible things that have happened. But of course, the dogs, right, they don't see that part of it. So it's actually quite beneficial to work with a dog that's just doing the job, right? Because that kind of keeps you focused. He said, especially up here, it was easy to get distracted with all the scenery. But yeah, Journey would, would uh, keep him in line, so he would stay working. So I don't know if you can see in the middle there, this is Journey. She's working at the campfire. So the campfire in 2018 was the most destructive fire in California history. Uh, 85 people lost their lives in that fire and 18,000 structures were destroyed. It was also, I believe, the most expensive wildfire in California history. And this is an example of another photograph that, um, you know, it's just remarkable, right? And so that's Mike in the white suit and then you can see Journey in the background, you know, signaling that she's found something. So I was not able to use this photograph in my book. Um, even the guy who took this photograph, Ricky Cariotti, is with the Washington Post. And he was game to have me use the photograph because, you know, it's a pretty remarkable photograph. But as it turns out, when you work for the Washington Post, you don't own the rights to your own photographs. So yeah, Washington Post was not willing to let me use the photograph in the book or they wanted some hundreds of dollars in order for me to do that. But yeah, there's Journey at work and in a pretty extreme environment, right? And then this is Patty with the uh, uh, Grand Pyrenees. These are the puppies. And so she and her husband have a sheep operation. You'll often see the sheep there down by Tom's place. And then um, these uh, Great Pyrenees are really incredible dogs. They're well, they're really cute for one thing. <laughs> That's one thing. Um, but they're also really big. I think I have another one here. Yeah. So they are guardian dogs and they're also nocturnal. So Robin was telling me about, yeah, this is a very unusual breed, not a pet breed. And they're very independent. So part of the 
part of their job is to be working at night out with the livestock, protecting the livestock from, you know, coyotes and bears and mountain lions. But they have to do a lot of independent decision making. And so they really need to act on their own. So they're not really domesticated the way other dogs are. But yeah, they are they are really massive dogs. And then independent minded. So Jennifer Rosner, this is uh, one of her dogs. She had uh, Katie and Katie Bell, and they would wander, you know, they would leave. And one of her dogs was even crossing 395, if you can imagine, to go visit, you know, some friends she had on the other side of the highway. But yeah, some really crazy stories about these dogs and how independent they are. And then this is Dot. She's a, a border collie. So, so Patty and her husband have about 30 border collies to run all the sheep and do all the work. Yeah. So she said, you know, it's really a big undertaking to take them for their annual shots or, you know, just transport them. She's like, yeah, I'm always calling my friends. Can you help move the dogs? They're like, oh, no, we're busy. <laughs> but yeah, this is Dot. She's a particularly well-known border collie that they have. And you can see I mean, it's just so interesting to see the instincts of the herding dogs. They have some really interesting videos on YouTube that you can see that where they've used a drone, you know, so you're high, you have a bird's eye view of the work that the Border Collies are doing as they herd sheep or whatever it is they're doing. And it's not, it's not obvious to me, at least it's not, you know, I think they must have like geometry in their heads or something to figure out the angles that they want to go at to to move the herds and then when they lie down and are quiet and then when they get up and move but yeah you really get to appreciate the kind of work that they're doing when you see those videos on youtube it's amazing and then total change of pace here uh, so this is willow she's an agility dog owned by lynn almeida the owner of spellbinders and this is a really famous dog also. Who knew that we had all these dogs in our midst? So Willow, Willow has won, um, has been placed in the top five in the country as an agility dog for a number of years. She's uh, aging now, I think she's retired. But yeah, she's really remarkable. And look at this cool photograph that, uh, again, a professional photographer took Nina Sage. But yeah, so she's going through uh, those bars, you know, they weave those weave bars that they go through. And again, you can see on YouTube videos of the agility dogs at work and the communication that there is between the handler and the dog, right? How the slightest signal from the handler will send the dog through the tunnel or out the tunnel the other way or through the weave or around it. It's just a lickety split, right? They're going just crazy speeds as fast as they can possibly run and reacting to these uh, instructions that they're getting. Lynn actually talked quite a bit in the book about building that relationship with the dog and how sometimes if we're not kind of challenging the dog that we are not using the dog to its fullest potential. So even a pet dog, not a working dog, but you can establish a stronger relationship and make the dog's life more interesting if you take on something like agility. So she's an organizer of the agility group down in Bishop and also up here in Mammoth. But yeah, those agility dogs, they're, they're really remarkable. Yeah, it's funny now that I'm all into dogs and everything. Social media is always flashing these things up in front of my face. Yeah, recommended for you. And it's always like, yeah, some agility competition or something. It's like, oh, she's going to like this. <laughs> and this is Buster. He's probably the most famous dog in the Eastern Sierra. And so Buster originally trained a little bit with King as an avalanche dog and kind of put that tool in his tool belt. And then his owner was Paul Dosti, the homicide detective with the Mammoth Lakes Police Department. And so Paul decided that he would challenge the dog even more so go beyond avalanche and also turn Buster into a cadaver dog, a human remains detection dog. And Buster excelled. So, is it, so Paul is a very expressive person. He said, you know, being, 
being an avalanche dog is kind of like high school. Being a human remains detection dog is like graduate school. <laughs> but bones and human remains do give off a lot of odor, at least often for Labradors, that they have those really remarkable noses. I learned more about their noses after I'd finished the book, and I wish that I had included some of that, just the physiology of a dog and how much they can smell. You know, we tend to smell as we inhale, but I guess dogs actually can smell both ways because they have a breathing uh, channel as well as a smelling channel. So they're, they're smelling 100% of the time. Then there are all these crazy things about how much better they can smell than humans, which it a lot better, basically. <laughs> so yeah, Booster, Buster actually traveled all over the world. He went to Japan and located some graves of American soldiers that were had been missing in action that had been buried there. And just really a lot of, and went to Europe also, did a lot of really interesting things, had many, many newspaper articles written about him, was used with some... Um, biologists who were trying to understand better the smells that come off of human remains. In fact, they named a piece of software Labrador because, uh, because of how good the dog's noses are. So here's Buster again, you know, noticeable. He's, he's really happy at work here. He's found something. So he's uh, indicating to his owner that he's, that he's found something. To us, of course, this is a, quite a ghoulish photograph. So some people were killed in that barn. And so their uh, remnants of that disaster uh, are, are located where Buster is. But look how happy Buster is. He doesn't know all of that part of it, right? He's just happy to be successful at his job. Uh, and this is another kind of sad story, but I wanted to include this update. So when I talked to Paul, this was one of the stories that he told me was about uh, Kristen Smart going missing out of Santa Cruz 20 some years ago. And so he told me that he had taken Buster over there. The uh, investigators were looking for a good Labrador and so, Labrador, and so uh, Buster got the call. And Buster uh, indicated when he was at a particular house, the house that was next door to the mother of the person who has now been arrested for having uh, murdered Kristen Smart. So 20 years ago, Buster indicated that there was something there. And, and um, Paul was explaining to me sort of the complexities of the investigation and why it hadn't gone forward. And the whole thing was kind of confusing to me. So eventually I said to him on the phone, well, do you think that she's, that she's buried in the backyard there? And he says, of course she is. <laughs> so, Paul's a very plain spoken person, but I think actually Buster might have been right. So here we are 20 years later, much more information has come forward and it does look as though her body was initially buried in that house in the lower left-hand corner, which was owned by the mother of the uh, person who was arrested uh, and charged with her murder. And then those are the two men, the father and the son, now, you know, 20 some years later, right? And then uh, the mother is here on the right-hand side who owned that house. The house above was owned by the father. And it seems as though indications are that they moved the body from the mother's house to the father's house. And now they've used dogs at that house also to, uh, to track that there are also human remains there. But, you know, it just kind of, I mean, it is sort of remarkable, right? You commit murder, you try and get away with it, you keep moving the body, right? And the dogs just keep <laughs> tracking you down. It's like, yeah, the dogs aren't gonna let you get away with this. <sighs> And here we are. Yeah, more of the Sierra Dog Ventures. Uh, so, you know, whether they're working dogs or whether they're pets, it's really fun to see uh, these dogs in action and doing what they love best, which is often just pleasing us and doing the best that they can. So, yeah, it was really fun to meet all these dogs and uh, learn more about them. So Christy, you know, studies dogs, right? Because she's out with them every day for long periods of time. And she said, 
you know, there's a lot of exercise, right? She's out with them pretty much all day. So they cover eight to 10 miles and the dogs, you know how dogs are, they're running all over the place. So they're probably doing maybe twice that, but it gives her a lot of opportunity to study dogs and how they interact with each other. She said something that really struck me. She said, you know, when the dogs all get together at the beginning of the day, there are often new dogs there. She said she's often really surprised at how accepting the dogs are of the new dogs, kind of regardless what breed they are, and that they have this uh, kind of attitude of, well, you know, here we all are, right? Here we all are together. We're going to have to make the best of this. She said even when there's a dog that has kind of you know, she said sort of a funky energy and she can see that maybe the other dogs don't like that dog that much. They still accept the dog, right? It's still, we're still in this together. We're still going to all go hang out together and kind of make the best of it, even though we have this, this uh, kind of, yeah, not the greatest dog ever with us. But yeah, interesting to see how dogs kind of handle situations like that socially. And this is it. So yeah, when I um, sell books, I do share the proceeds with the groups that uh, were kind enough to support the production of the book. And you can buy the book, well, actually here, you can buy it here tonight, um, but also at Bookie Joint, at the Welcome Centers that ECA runs, Spellbinders. And I uh, brought some more here up to Mono Lake, so we're there at the bookstore there and at the Eastern California Museum. Uh, Oh, cool. Yeah, good. And a couple dates to remember. Um, so the uh, ECA History Conference is going to be held live in Bishop this year on October 29th through 31st. And then the Eastern Sierra Book Festival is on July 18th. So that's two weeks from yesterday. And I have invited the dogs. I don't know how many of them will be able to come this year. But uh, yeah, there might be a few that come. And the, the book festival is held at Hayden Cabin, which is a very dog-friendly place. So you can bring your own dogs too. Yeah, we'll make a big fuss over them. The book festival um, has a really good speaker program lined up for this year, including our very own David Carl. And I think he's, yeah. So I'm very grateful to David. I think he's been to every book festival uh, so far. This is our fourth. Uh, last year we were on Zoom, but we're back to live this year. And I always ask David to do some weird thing or another at the book festival. And so this year I've asked him to debate me on uh, whether or not books matter. And David is taking the side of, I think, that books do matter. And I, uh, ironically, I'm taking the side of <laughs> that books don't matter. <laughs> I'm sure it will just be a great discussion. But yeah, please tune in to, to see who wins. <laughs> and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. The yeah, the festival's free. Yeah, exactly. There's one more photo. Oh. Oh. Oh, I forgot that I put this in here. Oh, that's funny. So yeah, I, I said, mentioned that I was uh, raised with German shepherds. This is Jet, and I could go on and on about Jet, all the all the just amazing things that she did. We were living on Long Island when we got her, and then we moved to Southern Indiana, where was, where I was raised, way out in the country on a huge property. And Jet was just uh, just really really helpful to us in leading us back home and acting as a guard dog and, you know, hurting the children. And, you know, she, she's kind of like, a, what's the TV show with the dog that was always alerting people for dangers? Lassie. Yeah, she was like our own Lassie. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the child has fallen down the well. And uh, she was a really, really great dog and obviously put up with me at, you know, whatever age I am there, one pulling on her ears probably. Yeah. Uh, could I could I ask you to repeat your question into the mic so the people at home can have the benefit of your question? 
I, I can repeat it too. So he asked me if I had discovered any Hollywood dogs here. Probably the closest that I found was Buster because, you know, he really had a lot of articles written about him. I don't, he, I'm sure he was on the news a lot, right? Because all the uh, newscasters like to show dogs, right? So, yeah. So he, you know, he, he was pretty famous actually that that dog Buster. Well, but other than that, I, don't, I yeah. haven't. I mean, the movies, I think, convinced me that if I was in an avalanche, that St. Bernard would show up with a cask of whiskey or something, right? So. <laughs> yeah, the whole St. Bernard thing is, a, I'm, I'm still a little unclear about that. Some people told me that they were too big to go in the helicopters and that that kind of spelled the end for St. Bernard's. But yeah, I'm not so sure. Christina mentioned, you know, in that photograph that she has there with Ayla, she said you have to be really careful when you're training a working dog when it's a puppy because it can really overreact and be frightened by something like a helicopter and they will be traumatized forever. They, they don't forget that they've had some bad experience like that. So yeah, that was, that was uh, interesting. So, you know, you can imagine snowmobiles, all the things that they that they will get the chair lifts having to go up the chair lifts so yeah the guide dog for the blind oh uh -huh. any other questions yeah please oh, okay oh uh, okay um having been in living in inventor county Mm -hmm. uh, how do you protect your dogs from rattlesnakes? I'll tell you my war story. I hiked <clears throat> all over Ventura County, Santa Barbara counties. Yep. Never had a problem. My dog got bitten in my backyard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, my understanding is, you know, I haven't talked to a dog expert specifically about this, but I have kind of watched some of the information that there is out there. I do think that they try and train the dogs not to get bit by a rattlesnake, which you can see, I mean, given all the other things dogs figure out how to do, they probably can figure that out also. But we would have trouble with that on our farm as well, that the dogs would get bit. And then my father had some uh, Jack Russell Terriers, and they didn't understand that a coyote pack is actually bigger and badder than they are. So he had a Jack Russell that was killed by coyotes. And my dad said, I'm sure they started, I'm sure the Jack Russell started it, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but I, I, you know, you can, you can, certain dogs, right? You can teach them to overcome their instincts, right? I mean, the Jack Russells are acting on instinct there, but maybe you can train them to, to recognize a rattlesnake and, and avoid the rattlesnake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I noticed nice. every every year there's training in Bishop about mm -hmm. rattlesnake avoidance. And I had a question uh -huh. um, about deer, um, oh, especially yeah. with these when you describe the going out with you know so many dogs running loose in in the area. Is there a way that they've trained the dogs to not chase wildlife or deer or whatever? I I didn't ask Christy that, but I imagine so. But I hear people in my neighborhood like when there's a bear in the neighborhood i hear the people yelling at their dogs to leave the bear alone you know yeah so i mean i that's part of it right is all all of us learning to get along right but i imagine you know one of the problems we had in southern indiana was dogs chasing cars i mean they love to chase cars and same thing in santa barbara when i lived there shoot you know you'd go out riding on your bike and you'd have these pack of dogs on you. I was like, I'm not fast enough to outrun a pack of dogs. But it's all training, right? I, I think a lot of it is we don't always understand how much we can train our dogs. And I think sometimes we just assume that they're sort of untrainable. So it's something for us to think about that maybe we ought to give the dogs a chance. Yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. I mean, the look at the training that they do for guide dogs through the blind. I mean, those dogs have to learn how to do their business in a certain particular way because the person taking care of them has to be able to retrieve their, their droppings, so to speak. So, yeah, there's, I mean, you can teach a dog a lot of stuff. Let's see, am I supposed to read? Oh. Oh, Alex is on the uh, Zoom. That's great. Yeah, so aversion training, very nice. I am great. Good. 
uh, was Jet named after? Um, I actually don't know how Jet got her name. Now I'll have to ask my parents how, how that happened. She might have come with her name. She actually came from a pretty good kennel on Long Island. I don't think my parents understood at the time. I mean, you know how it was back then. They had me, what they were, what, not, you know, 20 years old, so they knew nothing pretty much. But, but yeah, so they had gotten hold of a really good dog almost by accident. But I think she came with her name. So I actually don't know how she was named. Mm -hmm. And how much are dogs able to train other dogs? So Christy would say quite a bit that they show the dogs how things are done and that they provide leadership to the dogs and that they also intervene when things are going wrong. I think Leah, the woman who owns Bolt, would say the same thing. So she has quite a few dogs on that, on her uh, reservation uh, corral there in Bishop. And she says, you know, Bolt kind of keeps the other dogs in line to, you know, if they start to mess up, then the Bolt will, will intervene. <laughs> Anything else? Good. Well, thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, this thank was you wonderful. very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. This was awesome. And you did say you brought some books in case anyone would like a book. And then uh, we will have Jennifer's books available at the museum as well as in our online store. Uh, it'll be available in the online store after tomorrow. And, uh, and then at the museum when we open back up on Thursday. Uh, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Thank you, Chris. And yes, yay, our technical guru. This was our, this was our first hybrid meeting, and um, it seems like it worked. It seems like it worked. For people at home. Well, but uh, as long as I got Jennifer's part, that was great. That was great. And now next month, uh, first Monday in August, and we will have Dave Carl and the name of the presentation. I don't have my paper with me. A pertinent history of fire in Eastern California. And you have, is this a second edition of a book? Okay, and then Dave's book is Introduction of Fire in California. The Introduction to Fire in California. And that's the second edition. So that will be next month. And please get online, buy ghost tickets, come by the museum, buy ghost tickets, raffle tickets. We appreciate it. And if you would like to volunteer for the box sorting. Please remember to email the curator at monobasinhistory.org email. Thank you so much. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, great. And then it, as people come by the museum that are from another area, we've got flyers that we can give you if you would like to put them in your area. Let's say you're down in Bishop or, um, or up Walker, that Bridgeport way. We'll, there you go at the book festival. All right. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. And we will hope, hopefully see you next month.